So at CoinGate conference, um, Craig has talked about our puzzle. So there are actually a lot of usage and applications of our puzzle. Um, but before we dive into all the applications, we just try to describe what is the technical background on our puzzle. Oh, okay. Um, so first of all, what is uh, ECDSA signature? So just briefly um, describe um, the algorithms for signing and verification. So the input um, a key pair called public and private key pair. So you have S1 being the private key and P1 being the public key. And both of, uh, P1 is a uh, point on the ellipse curve and G is the generator. And now of course you have a message M uh, to be signed. <coughs> So we first create a random uh, ephemeral public private key pair. So we have this R equal to K dot G. So if, if you just compare two equations, there is a kind of a similarity there. So K is our uh, ephemeral private key and R is our ephemeral public key. And then we take the X coordinate of R. Uh, again, R is a point on the elliptic curve. So you have two coordinates and we take R as, as the X coordinate and we calculate S. A little, the little s as k minus one hash of the message times hash of the message plus s one which is the private key and times r which is the, which is the x coordinate of r and then we do mod n so n is the order of uh, elliptic curve group point group so basically there are n uh, points on on that elliptic curve now we have s we have r little r little s so they form our signature so this is the signing algorithm to produce a signature. R and the S, okay? Um, if you have any question, just stop me, okay? That's normal signing, not special here Sorry? This is normal signing. This is, normal. Uh, this is ECDSA signing algorithm. So basically, for example, uh, there are a lot of variations. Here I said hash of M, but sometimes you can truncate hash of M to get exact uh, length of this hash of M. But that is the basic signing algorithm. Uh, oh, no, that's not new, no. So this is uh, basically the technical background of ECDSA signature. Okay, verification. So we receive R and S, two pairs, uh, one pair, uh, two numbers. So we take um, uh, S, uh, which is calculated as that, and we do S dot K dot G. So K uh, is the um, ephemeral private key. And then we have this hash of m, g plus r dot s1 dot g. So if we substitute uh, the public key and then the ephemeral key r, we will get that equation. And then we multiply by s minus 1, we, to, we will get that. Um, so to verify the signature, we only have to calculate uh, the right hand side. And if you just look, and, and the x coordinate of the right hand side. And, and if we just look at the right hand side, uh, we have this um, hash of m, which is known, s minus 1, which is the, y code, uh, y, which is the second number in the uh, digital signature. And then you have this r, which is the first part of the signature. p1 is the public key, g is the generator, so we know everything, and therefore we can calculate. And once we calculate that, we get uh, basically r, and then we take the x coordinate of r and compare that with the little r and see if they're equal. So this is ECDSA signature, and it, it is extensively used in Bitcoin, as we all know. Now, we're just trying to dive into this uh, long string of numbers we saw earlier. What are they, basically? So um, in Bitcoin, we use DER coding. So DER stands for Distinguished Encoding Rules. So it's a standard rule. Um, so the first byte, uh, which is called sequence identifier. So basically, uh, sig signifies that there is a signature coming. And then the next byte uh, specifies the length of the sequence. So basically, in this case, 46 bytes. And then we have another um, byte followed by length of sequence, uh, which is the integer identifier. So this is to signify the next integer, which is uh, in this particular case, 21. So we'll have the first byte, the second byte, the third byte, and then we come to this, um, the fourth byte. So the fourth byte 
specifies the length of R. Okay? So we know the signature contains two elements, R and S. And the fourth byte uh, specifies the length of R. So in this particular case, 21 means, uh, means 33. So it's a hex. So 1 plus 2 times 16, which is 33. So basically, we are expecting 33 bytes for R. Okay? So the first byte of R is 00, zero and, the sec and the rest, which is 32 bytes, are this long string. So basically, the Bitcoin node will be able to understand this and extract R. Okay? Um, and I will talk about this a little bit, uh, this chunk uh, more later. There's a hidden, hidden node there. So the rest is just um, uh, the rest, the, the uh, S part and the SIG hash type. So SIG hash type is a flag you have to add to a signature RNS to indicate which part of a transaction your signature is actually signing on. And there are, I think, uh, six choices. Um, so the, the explanation of that is, I think, out of scope of this talk. But in this talk, we'll concentrate on this part. So the idea is that when we receive the signature string, we want to use opcodes to extract our part. Okay? And we believe that within, uh, with existing opcodes, we're able to do that. Now, I just want to explain a little bit um, more about this uh, uh, chunk here. So basically, the length of R can either be 32 or 33, and when the leading byte of R is greater than 7F, then you have to add double zero, which is the zero byte in front of it. In this particular case, the leading byte is E9, okay, which is certainly greater than 7F, because E is greater than 7 in hex. Okay? And therefore, we have to add zero, zero. And the reason is that once you have an, a leading byte that is greater than 7F, this implies the binary string of R has a leading one, okay? And that leading one will be interpreted by this DR rules, the uh, distinguished encoding rules, as a sign, negative sign. But that one doesn't mean a negative sign. So what we do is we actually append double zero to tell the DR, the rules that we are not actually dealing with negative numbers. So whenever you have a R value which has a leading byte greater than 7F, you have to append zero. So that's why you have 33 bytes sometimes. Okay? Now, so that's our part, and that is how we are uh, trying to extract that. <clears throat> now, this is the script that we are going to use to extract our part. So we will show that in the demo uh, in, a just, uh, in a moment, but let's just go through this manual debugger first. So we have op3, which means we want to split a string at the third byte. So we have one byte, second, two bytes, th the third byte, we want to split that, okay? So we will get rid of the, th uh, get, we will get a string, split that, and then we do op nip. So op nip is just to remove the second element on the stack. Okay? So it will remove this. When we split the string, we will remove the part that we don't want. And we left the string with, the, uh, with, with, with something we want inside the string. And then we want to split again, but this time we just want to split out the byte that indicates the length of R. Okay? And we need that. So we do a swap so that the length that indicates the, uh, the byte that indicates the length of R will be on the top of the stack. And then we split again. So this time, we will be able to get R parts because the length of the um, R is known and the split will know where exactly to get R. And then we drop the rest of the signature. Okay, that's how we get R part. Any question? <laughs> So this is the string we're receiving, 30, 46, 0, et cetera. That is the, if you concatenate everything here, that is the string we put in the Bitcoin uh, unlocking script in order to unlock normal standard pay to public hash 
uh, transactions, okay? So you have a signature here, basically, and that, those three are the first three bytes. We don't want that, so we split them at three, so we put three there, op split, so the string will split like this, and then we drop that, we get rid of that using op nip, okay? And then that is the string we left. And then we use op one, which will split the string here, okay? But when we split that here, this particular byte is very important for us because we know exactly which position to split again next by looking at this value. It says 33 this time. So the rest of string will take the 33, the first 33 bytes, which are those, okay, and then split that. And then we get rid of this, the white bit here, so we're left with that. And that is exactly the R value we need. Is that clear? It will be much clearer if we do the demo later, okay? We just want to finish that uh, slide here. So that's the script to extract R. And then finally, we are going to present you the full script for pay to R puzzle uh, hash, so P to R P H. So first of all, this is the unlocking script. So the unlocking script will be will always be the first to fetch to the uh, stack. So what you get is that you duplicate uh, you duplicate you duplicate this signature first, because you want to use check seek verify that. So you, you don't want to consume that instantly. So you want to so you first duplicate that. And then you use the extract R opcodes here to extract R value. So you consume one copy of the signature. And then you hash that R, okay? You hash the R. And then you check if that is equal to this hash value. If it is equal, you swap. You need to swap, right? Because the check seek will take PB first and then um, signature later. You swap and then you do check seek and everything just works out, okay? Any questions? <laughs> um, so this is basically another way to, um, to do pay to public hash. It's an alternative to pay to public hash. And what we're doing here actually is trying to explore the equivalence between the ephemeral keys and the public keys. And that equivalence is always there in cryptography but has never been explored and being made use of. And this is how we use that. Demo time. Ah, sorry, I forgot to mention that. Remember that PB over there? Yeah. The public key, PB? Yeah. You can choose any public key you want because there's no requirement on PBN at all. There, there's only one requirement on R. And in order to get the right R, you have to know the ephemeral private key, K. So in pay to public key hash, you have to know the private key corresponding to that public key. In pay to R puzzle hash, you have to know the ephemeral private key to R, okay? So that's the comparison. And what we're doing here is to pr provide an alternative to pay to public hash. And on top of that, there are other applications make full usage of this where P, uh, public key cannot. So there is a equivalence or similarity between uh, public private key pair and ephemeral key pair, but there's also asymmetric uh, properties between them and some of them can be explored to, to have some other applications. So let's just try this um, demo. More questions? Sorry? Oh, so uh, as I said, there is a equivalence However, there's also a symmetry because the calculation of the signature, when you're using the ephemeral public key, you do k minus one times the entire thing, right? And then this private key is inside that brackets because the two position, if you look at it, they are different. They're not entirely sym symmetric to each other. So there is a way to explore the difference. But we address that in our white paper, but I don't think I can explain that in this short period, okay? But just make sure it's not um, 
exactly the same. When you try to replace any scenario where you have public key with a ephemeral public key, you might run into troubles. Just make sure you double check with your security, okay? <clears throat> or you can ask us. Um, so, yeah, so what happens here is that we have a signature here. So just to look at this thing, this chunk here is the signature, and this is the public key, which we don't really care about it at the moment. So we put the signature on the stack. Um, I think we need to put the public key on the stack first, sorry. Sorry, yeah, we need to put the public key on the stack first. Oh, okay. So we can, okay, if we do that, then we don't need the public key. So we can remove the public key. Yeah, so if we just remove that, we can remove that public key. Oh, you do want to refresh? Okay. So, yeah, the whole, the whole thing here. So, yeah, that's it. So that's the signature. So we put the signature in the unlocking script. And then we're trying our extracting R scripts here. This one. Mm -hmm. And then we load that, and then we do that one step by step. So we push the signature onto the stack first. Why there's a public key here? I think it works. Uh, okay, can we just remove that? I think this one is moving too. No, it will not. Yeah, can we just remove that public key? Sorry, guys. So you just want the first bit? Yes. This. This. Which is the signature? This is the signature. That's the signature. Okay. Let's move that. Now that's why. That's why. This is. It was it was auto filling it. That was a problem. Ah, because okay. The, I see. Auto, auto filling. Yeah. Okay. You still have this. Yeah. Can we just delete that here? No. 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 <laughs> we can't delete that. Uh, is it here? Yeah, there should, should be, yeah. yeah. Ends in one zero. Yeah. So I'm interested in what the real world uh, yeah. uses. Yeah. It's one and zero. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. That's it. That's Sorry? What about the real world use cases for things that aren't in the world? What's the name of the city now that we can do before? So, first of all, um, there are more to pay to uh, our puzzle hash. Um, one user case uh, we, we've uh, thought about is the general knowledge proof. So think about a hash puzzle, for example. So at the moment, when you have a hash puzzle or hash bounty, so basically whoever found the pre-image will be able to claim 10 BTC, for example. What happens is that as of now, you have to put the pre-image in your unlocking script and trying to claim that. It was fine back to 2009 because everyone will be able to mine that transaction. So basically, you have to mine that yourself. But now, when you publish that transaction, miners will be able to see your solution. And then they can actually take your solution and then claim the bounty themselves. So basically, there's a race to actually mine your transaction with their own output. So what happens with our puzzle is that you can actually embed that solution inside K. So in, if you know the solution, you know K, then you can work out R, right? And then all you have to do to put a hash bounty on chain is to actually put a hash of R on chain. So whoever knows the pre-image will be able to work out what K is. And therefore, when they publish the solution, they actually publish R instead of K. And if you're a miner, you will now be able to figure out what K is. And if you want to copy that signature, you have to know the private key in order to generate that signature. But you don't, you know, uh, any miner will know neither of them. 
and therefore they cannot change the output. Bear in mind, output is signed by the signature. Okay, so that's just one, and it can be anything. For example, if, if a mathematical professor creates a, a problem set for students, whoever work out first can claim like one BTC, then they can do hash of the uh, solution or even just do solution, hash that to a, a number that is suitable to be K, and then work out what R is, and publish R on chain. The students work out the solution, get K, create signature using that ephemeral key and any public key. So for in this particular case, it could be his identity public key to, to show the math professor that he actually worked out or anything like that. And there are other applications. We have thought about at least 10 of them. And uh, we've, write, <laughs> we've written a, a white paper on, on that. Um, but uh, we're happy to uh, disclose more applications after the talk. Okay. Okay, cool. Uh, so we're back here. Okay, cool. We have a signature here on the stack, and then we do op three. Okay. So we are about to do op split. So we will count one, two, three, and then we split. Okay. So that's what we did. So three bytes here, and the rest is there, and then we do op nip. So op nip is an op code that actually remove the second item on the stack. And in this particular case, it will be that three bytes, okay? Now we have a new string now. We want to split further. So we do op one and then op split. So basically we want to get this 21 on the stack, okay? Okay, we did that. And then we want to use op split again but we need 21 to be on top of the string, so we do op swap, okay? And then we split. So this time, just to remember, uh, remind you again, 21 means 33, okay? So this is not a decimal number, it's a hex. So 33 bytes will be given on the stack. Can we try split? Okay, we got that now. So we have this 33 bytes here. That's all we want. That's the R value. We don't want the rest. So we, we do op drop to drop the first item. And now we have the R value. And then in this particular case, we just want to check if it is the R value we need. So we push the R value onto the stack again, and then we do op equal. And then we check if they are equal. So this is basically how you extract R value and check whether it's equal. Once you, once you are able to extract R value, you can do a lot of things on that. You can do hash, which provides you pay to uh, R puzzle hash, and you can do addition, actually, uh, and it could be point addition, and that will drive you into a very wild uh, application world. Um, yeah, I think that's it. So the last uh, demo is just uh, the same, but instead we check R value, we check the hash of the R value. How did you manage it that earlier? It, it's, auto, it's automatically filling it in. Okay. So yeah, this should be okay. There you go. Okay. Cool. So again, just go through this again. So we have a signature there on the stack, and then we try to split that. So op three, op split, and then we get rid of that, and then we do op one, op split, and then op swap, we get our value. So we do op split, and then we get rid of the rest. So we get this R value here. So we, we want to hash that now. So we hash that, and then we check whether it is equal to the hash value we put on chain. And then we do op equal, and here we go. Verified. Okay, so that's all. Any questions? I'm asking an extension to Mark's question that the, you explained that potentially the solution, the solution might be using this and uh, the new script. Are you saying that the, with the existing paper hash script, potentially the miner can still? Solution, pay, hole. You mean pay to public key hash? Yes, so you what? Question, sorry. Can you repeat the uh, okay. So basically, he's asking um, there is a if there is a security hole with existing hash puzzle, 
using pay to script hash. Yes. Um, so first of all, because you didn't specify the public key, so anyone can actually add in their public key. The only thing you need to know is the uh, uh, pre-image, right? So in the pay to script hash, you still have to provide pay to script hash. Yeah, you still have to provide the pre-image, right? There's no way you can avoid that. I mean, you can, of course, by using that. But in general, you have to construct knowledge proof. So the bad thing about our puzzle is that you actually trying to make advantage of check seek to act as a knowledge proof verification. That's the best part. So you don't have to create all those new opcodes or any other things that are trying to verify a very complica complicated knowledge proof. Just do check seek. Everything is there. So that's the idea of our puzzle. Okay. Okay. Thank you.